Welcome to Pod Save the World. I am Ben Rhodes, and Tommy is still out, uh, as as you know, taking uh, some uh, needed time off. Um, so continue to keep the chair warm for him. Um, but we have a great show today. We have two guests with us, Joshua Yaffa, who's the uh, New Yorker's Russia correspondent, who talked to us from Kiev, uh, where he's observing firsthand uh, the preparations being made for a potential invasion uh, in the country of Ukraine. And then we talked to Amarnath Amar Asingham, who is an expert on radicalism and extremism in Canada. So he's the perfect guy to talk to about the continuing insane trucker, freedom convoy, far-right, mishmash, QAnon mess up in Canada. Um, some connection between these two topics in that uh, the same kind of far-right ethno-nationalist force that Putin himself represents is, as you'll hear from our guest, uh, creeping into our usually much more peaceful and civilized neighbor to the north. But first, let's catch up a little bit uh, on the main story, which we've all been following, uh, which is the situation in Ukraine. The United States continues to prepare for a potential invasion at any moment, taking a very dramatic step in closing the embassy in Kyiv uh, and essentially moving that diplomatic representation to a city far, far to the west uh, of Ukraine, closer to the Polish border. Um, we've also heard uh, from the administration that they're preparing tabletop exercises to be ready for a potential Russian invasion, uh, one including cabinet members uh, walking through the scenarios. I used to do these in government. Uh, what do you do the first hour, the first day, the first week of a potential scenario? You know, for all intents and purposes, the U.S., Ukraine, the world remains on high alert. Uh, NATO's secretary general has said that members of the alliance have not seen any sign of de-escalation from Russia. President Biden, uh, as I'll get to later, uh, even mentioned today that the number of Russian troops uh, around Ukraine is 150,000, which is a higher number than we've heard. While the U.S. and NATO continue to sound the alarm, uh, Putin began to sound something of a different note. Uh, he appeared on television this week, including one appearance at a very large and long table with his foreign minister, who was briefing him uh, on the diplomacy uh, around Ukraine. Uh, Putin said that Russia is, quote, ready to continue on the negotiating track, uh, but will keep pushing for a rollback of the NATO presence in Eastern Europe and a guarantee that Ukraine will never join NATO. We've also seen some announcements out of the Russian government that they're prepared to begin to pull back some of those troops that have been encircling Ukraine, uh, but we've yet to actually see that pullback happen. Uh, and I can tell you from firsthand experience, as much as I hope that that is the case and that those troops begin to pull back, uh, it is not above or beyond Vladimir Putin or Sergei Lavrov to just lie uh, in the things that they say. So we'll have to, to monitor what happens. Meanwhile, in Ukraine, President Zelensky declared a day of unity on February 16th, the day that this podcast comes out and the day that some experts have identified as a potential start date of a Russian invasion. With all that going on, all those mixed messages uh, from all over the place, we heard in what was a previously unscheduled uh, speech on Tuesday afternoon from President Biden, who updated the country uh, on the situation in Ukraine. Here's a little bit of what he had to say. To the citizens of Russia, you are not our enemy. And I do not believe you want a bloody, destructive war against Ukraine. World War II was a war of necessity. But if Russia attacks Ukraine, it would be a war of choice or a war without cause or reason. The world will not forget that Russia chose needless death and destruction. Invading Ukraine will prove to be a self-inflicted wound. The United States and our allies and partners will respond decisively. The West is united and galvanized. Okay, so there's something of a, a darker take on events from uh, the President of the United States. Um, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, a few things stood out to me from from Biden's speech. And we do talk later uh, when I talk to Joshua Yaffa about the possibility that Putin is climbing down and there could be a diplomatic resolution. But if you listen to President Biden's speech, you know, he indicated he's open to diplomacy. He wants to resolve this through diplomacy, uh, but he did not seem particularly optimistic. It sounded more like a speech that was preparing people in the United States and in Russia, as we heard in that clip, and around the world for a potentially very damaging and destructive war uh, in Ukraine and a lot of fallout consequences from that, um, which I'm going to unpack in, in, in a second here. You also heard uh, Biden really reiterate his point that he's not going to negotiate Ukrainian membership in NATO with Russia, 
um, underscoring his view of the principle that nations should be able to choose whatever alliances they want. Um, so it was not an olive branch on the core thing that, that Putin's been seeking, which is that assurance that Ukraine won't ever join NATO and that NATO itself will kind of pull back from Russia's border. Instead, you heard Biden reiterate things that have been said before about the U.S. being willing to negotiate around transparency and arms control, you know, being upfront about troop deployments, missile deployments, military exercises. Um, thus far, that hasn't been enough for Vladimir Putin. We'll see um, if he takes that off ramp uh, in the days to come. But then I think a lot of Biden's speech was meant to prepare people for the worst case scenario of a Russian invasion. In that clip we played, he's speaking directly to Russians. Um, and I thought that that was an important kind of rhetorical tack he took uh, as a speechwriter. Uh, I used to do that sometimes, you know, have President Obama address directly a foreign audience. And if you listen to what he said, he was really speaking to the cost that Russia would face of an invasion, speaking to the fact that it would be bloody, that Russia would likely be taking significant casualties uh, this time around, unlike Crimea, where they faced no resistance because they're moving into a uh, part of Ukraine where they already had a military base and you had a pretty large pro-Russian population and there wasn't a lot of resistance. This time, if he invades Ukraine, it, it would clearly be different. Um, and Biden spoke to the fact that this would be a war of choice, as you heard him say. I think this is of a piece with how transparent this administration has been about the intelligence they have about an invasion. If you're watching and thinking, why do these guys keep talking about this? Why do they keep telegraphing what they know about this? Uh, I think one of the core reasons is they're seeking to deny Vladimir Putin the play that he would always try to run, which is to frame anything he does as defensive, to kind of invent a pretext, you know, in a Ukrainian attack on Russians in eastern Ukraine or some provocation from the Ukrainians or even the United States that kind of forced him, Putin, to invade this country. You know, I think Biden smartly, um, both in terms of what he said today and what he's been doing with his administration over the course of the last several weeks, is making it impossible for, for Putin to be anything other than the aggressor here um, and essentially being the play by play announcer for this Russian military buildup. Um, he's leaving no room, little room at least, for any capacity of Putin to manipulate global public opinion. And keep in mind, it's not just the American audience or even just the Russian audience, which you know, Putin can shape a lot through propaganda, but that international audience that um, Biden really wants uh, to see Putin as the aggressor uh, in the event uh, of an invasion. And, you know, the Russians, too, as you, we hear from Joshua Yaffa today, we heard from Zanin Amsova a couple weeks ago, you know, the Russian people are not quite as geared up for this thing as uh, they were for the annexation of Crimea, in part because this is a harder endeavor and they know it will be, in part because sanctions have already taken a toll on their economy and they don't want to face more sanctions. Um, but you heard from Biden today kind of an indication of what could be really the scenario of an invasion uh, and the negative consequences that can flow. And, and so I think we should just kind of go through those just so we're prepared for that psychologically. You know, first of all, if you're talking about the scale of invasion that 150,000 Russian troops uh, could bring into Ukraine, this is something that, that dwarfs anything that we've seen in the past in eastern Ukraine or Crimea. This is a land war like we haven't seen in Europe since, you know, if not the Balkans, all the way back to World War II. And, you know, you've seen estimates that 50,000 people could be killed. You know, that's just a rough number, but tens of thousands of civilians could be killed in bombing and fighting. Uh, a, a significant number of casualties among the Ukrainian military, the Russian military. This would be a really deadly and destructive war. And that would just be the first phase. If Russia does succeed in potentially dismantling or dislodging the Ukrainian government and install some puppet regime, I think we could expect long-term resistance from within Ukraine, uh, ongoing fighting, an insurgency or a civil war of sorts that could drag this out. Wars, once they begin, can lead to much more deadly and damaging consequences than were envisioned at the beginning. Even the relatively low-grade conflict in eastern Ukraine has taken over 10,000 lives to date. Um, and that's a relatively concentrated area of fighting that hasn't been anywhere near the full scale that we're looking at here today. Um, and that's just the military aspects. Then you talk about the, the U.S. and uh, NATO response. Um, you know, as Biden indicated today, the sanctions that they're envisioning would include cutting off Russia from certain technologies through export controls, the United States preventing the export of certain technologies to Russia, the United States sanctioning the key Russian banks 
essentially trying to cut off the Russian economy from the international financial system so they can't conduct kind of basic transaction and access uh, currency. This would hit the Russian economy really hard. Vladimir Putin does have a very large war chest of reserves, uh, I think over $600 billion that they've kind of stored away for a rainy day. But, you know, make no mistake, this would impact ordinary Russians. It would lead to shortages. It would lead to economic hardship there. I think what it will also do, and Biden references today, is it'll hurt the U.S. and European economies as well. I mean, make no mistake, if we're taking a large amount of Russian energy off the market, energy prices are going to go up. Gas prices are going to go up. It's going to have uh, impacts on markets that go beyond just uh, energy prices. If Russia wants to reciprocate, it has a lot of raw materials, for instance, that feed into global supply chains. Russia can disrupt those supply chains. And as we've all learned this year, that can drive up inflation even more. Uh, so the consequence to U.S. sanctions is not just going to be felt in Russia. It could be felt in the global economy, and it could exacerbate some of the economic challenges that we're having here in the United States. Uh, it's also been the experience with Putin that if he feels like the United States is contributing to efforts to, say, kill Russian forces by arming the Ukrainians or supporting a potential insurgency inside Ukraine, there are other types of responses that Putin could do. Um, one which Biden kind of alluded to today uh, is he could target Americans in Ukraine. Um, there are a significant amount of Americans in Ukraine. Um, second, he could launch cyber attacks into the United States uh, to try to uh, mess with, disrupt, cripple aspects of our economy, targeting private companies, targeting critical infrastructure, denial of service attacks, um, hacks into the U.S. government. We've seen Russia have this capacity. If they kind of fully weaponized it, we could be facing a degree of cyber assault that we haven't experienced before in this country. Um, and in that case, I think you know the U.S. would likely respond with its own cyber attacks on Russian critical infrastructure. And we could see a tit for tat escalating where we're living with a different kind of cyber war um, than we faced uh, to date. I think those Russian disinformation campaigns that we've all lived with, um, where they fueled everything from political polarization in the United States to anti-vax uh, efforts in the United States, including um, the kind of efforts that spill across the border into Canada, um, you could see a pretty dramatic escalation in Russian information and, 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 and disinformation campaigns uh, into the United States and efforts to kind of disrupt politics in the West uh, generally. Um, so you know, we're talking about a conflict, again, if it's the full Russian invasion of this country, that is not going to feel as isolated from us and the rest of the world as the events in Crimea or Eastern Ukraine felt. Um, you're talking about real warfare on the ground. You're talking about economic warfare through these sanctions. It's going to have ripple effects. You're talking about potentially asymmetric and cyber warfare back and forth. You're talking about potentially escalating disinformation campaigns. Um, this is what we could all be dealing with over the course of the year if, and I stress if, um, the worst case scenario of a large scale Russian invasion moves forward. I think part of what is sunk in for everybody um, is that this would be bad for everybody. Um, it'd be bad for Ukrainians, first and foremost, because they're right there in the crosshairs. It would be potentially very bad for Russians who would suffer directly in the war, but also suffer a lot of economic impacts. And that could lead to its own kind of instability in Russia. It could hurt the, the European and American economies. Uh, it could raise tensions along NATO's border with Russia um, and you know the potential incident of a direct confrontation between Russian and American forces. That's that's the supreme worst case scenario here. So this is a big deal. And I know people, you know, may be tired of hearing about, uh, you know, the, the, the invasion that that hasn't happened yet. Um, let's hope it doesn't happen. Let's hope there's an off ramp or uh, even if something does happen, there are scenarios that are far less catastrophic than what I just outlined. You know, Russia could choose to formally recognize the two chunks of eastern Ukraine that it de facto occupies or it could annex those territories or or try to to, to bite off another smaller chunk of, of Ukraine. That would be very bad, too. But I do think it's worth getting our minds around the really extreme scenario of what could happen if those 150,000 troops move in in a fully mechanized invasion. And frankly, I think that's what President Biden was trying to prepare people for today, despite the recent olive branches or at least change in tone uh, coming out of the Kremlin. Only man who knows what's going to happen is Vladimir Putin. 
that's the way he likes it. <laughs> I'm sure he likes it. Everybody's talking about him. And up next, I'm going to talk to Josh Oyafa, who knows a lot about Vladimir Putin, has lived and reported from Putin's Russia, and is reporting from Kiev today. Uh, after the break, we'll hear from Joshua. I'm very pleased to be joined by Joshua Yaffa, who's a correspondent for The New Yorker, uh, who's been based uh, a lot in Moscow over the years. Um, he's also the author of a really tremendous book, uh, Between Two Fires, Truth, Ambition, and Compromise in Putin's Russia, um, which gives you a flavor of, of how Russians have experienced uh, Putin's time in office and, and, and what Russia is like. Um, uh, I found it incredibly uh, illuminating to read when I was working on my book and and actually just a really fun read too, uh, a great character. So Joshua, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, thanks, glad to be here. Thanks for the generous introduction. So you are in Kiev, I should have said, and uh, you just recently wrote a piece for uh, The New Yorker about how people there are dealing with this constant warning of the imminence of, of war. <laughs> um, I, I guess I'd just start there. Like, what is what is the mood like? Um, uh, what, what are you... Uh, I detected some fatalism in, in uh, the attitudes of the people in your piece, uh, but but how would you describe it? Yeah, that? I've been here about a week. Um, and when I arrived, I felt like people still weren't quite believing the talk of war, at least not the way it was being discussed in the West. And, and that was a, a narrative that had been picked up on by many of my colleagues who had been here much longer before, um, before I. And uh, we saw this in the statements of Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky himself, who seemed to be taking issue with the degree of certainty um, or alarmism, you might say, in some of the US assessments that have been coming out in previous weeks. And, and that felt like an attitude I was picking up, not just among people in the Zelensky administration or you know, close to government, but, but everyday Ukrainians who felt like the idea of a full frontal Russian assault on Ukraine, you know, potentially trying to take Kiev, felt difficult to imagine. Of course, difficult to imagine doesn't mean impossible to happen. Um, right, so it's 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 hard to uh, locate that point on which people are being, um, you know, naive about the threat, or or on the opposite, people are you know um, avoiding the kind of alarmism or hysteria that perhaps took over some quarters of the American media. You know, those are debates <laughs> that Ukrainians themselves were having. Right, that's my the best way I can answer. The, the, the question is to say that people themselves were trying to figure out where is the right place on that spectrum uh, to be. I think the most important kind of underlying or historical factor we should keep in mind is, is, is what war, uh, war especially brought and instigated by Russia means for Ukraine, uh, nothing new uh, in the sense that, you know, this began, well, one point we can pick to in history, right? We could go all the way back, I don't know, to, um, you know, Middle Ages or at least, you yeah. know, foundation of the Soviet Union, but let's just pick 2014 to not get completely kind of lost in, in the back um, history, but that was the time when Russia annexed Crimea and launched a kind of faux would-be separatist conflict in the Donbass region in eastern Ukraine, a grinding war that continues um, to this day, very much backed by uh, Russia, including the Russian military. So the notion of a Russian invasion, of course, we were talking about something of a different scale than has been happening in Donbass, yeah. and Ukraine, but the idea of you know, a Russian military operation against Ukraine was something that Ukrainians felt like they had been living with for a long time and had heard episodic warnings over the past eight years that it was about to get bigger. The Russian um, in, you know, invasion force or operation force in Donbass was about to expand. It was about to uh, go out from Donbass and to t capture more Ukrainian territory. So there is an element of, of I, I'm not sure if fatalism is the right word to describe it, but definitely people being a bit inured to war talk and feeling like they've heard talk of war and have learned psychologically to live with talk of war uh, over the course of many years. Yeah. Well, and I want to get into some of the kind of specifics that might be on the table in any possible de-escalation and because there's some developments today. But I, I wanted to ask one other bigger picture question, drawing on your experience in Russia and Ukraine, which is that there's kind of two ways of looking at what's happening. <laughs> um, uh, they're overlapping, but they're somewhat distinct. One is there's a competition, a conflict between Russia and the U.S. and the West, right? Uh, this is Putin saying these big strategic issues have to be resolved to my liking on issues like NATO enlargement and, you know, the, the post-global order that America constructed that kind of rubbed Russia's face in it. 
Um, so there's there's this there's a world in which Ukraine just happens to be the bystander, the hostage in this conflict between uh, Putin and and the United States, really, um, and the in the order that it represents. And then there's a separate way of looking at it where people like Putin, you know, never accepted that Ukraine is truly an independent country. And Putin himself has kind of made comments to that regard and that there's this kind of, you know, the ancient history of Kiev Rus and the, the cultural and linguistic ties. And this is an effort to right an historical wrong that is very much about Ukraine and not just the United States um, and, and kind of Russia's claim to some extent on, on Ukraine. Do Ukrainians feel like they're caught in a proxy war or do they feel acutely the kind of Russian imperial desire kicking in again? <laughs> you know, like how should we think about um, that aspect of it. Is this about Russia and the West or is this about Russia and Ukraine? Or I, I suspect it's about both, but how do you, how do you unpack that? You're right. I'm afraid your suspicion is, is correct. And it, it's, I don't, I don't mean to kind of give a squishy um, answer. Um, so I'll try, I'll try to kind of be more precise than just saying, you know, it's, it's both uh, the first and the second. It very much is about Russia's big picture historical grievances, Putin specifically. It's very clear that on an individual level, Putin feels really um, aggrieved and offended and injured almost in a moral way by the way that the West um, treated Russia in the 90s and, and beyond and, and created that post-Cold War security architecture that you alluded to and feels like Russia's interests very much were not respected and also feels like that's in a way almost ahistorical, right? The, this period in the waning years of the Soviet Union as the Soviet Empire was collapsing in the late 80s with Gorbachev in charge and then once it finally gave way and, and we had independent Russia in the 90s under Boris Yeltsin, Putin sees that period not entirely incorrectly as a relatively short-lived period of ahistorical Russian weakness um, and feels like in that short period, the West took advantage of Russia and was able to force through various agreements and arrangements that then became quasi-permanent. And now that Russia is no longer in this position, uh, of weakness now that Putin, in his own mind, has righted the ship, it's only correct uh, that he go back and try and relitigate some of these questions where he feels like Russia's interests were not uh, properly or fully considered and where Russia wasn't able to stick up for itself to make sure that those interests were listened to. So that's the, that's the big picture issue driving uh, what's happening now and, and, and Putin trying to reopen these old debates that for most politicians in the West feel like pretty settled, but for Putin um, feel like open history or history that, that should, can and should be readdressed. How that actually happens, like the, the canvas uh, where that takes place very much is Ukraine. So I think, you know, this idea of, of a proxy is uh, correct. I mean, it's unfortunate and unfair for Ukraine to be trapped in this position. But I think that Ukraine is first and foremost where Putin sees this larger battle being waged. It's the, it's the place where he can draw his own red lines, you know, pick your metaphor for, for what's going on here, but it's the place where he can say enough is enough, you know, this is the this is the issue or this is the set of issues that is critically important to me. You know, Ukraine in NATO is something intolerable uh, to Russia, at least as Putin sees it from a security standpoint. And I think importantly, Putin came to see that even short of official or formal NATO membership, the idea of NATO weaponry and NATO troops um, you know, building up in Ukraine uh, was was equally threatening. You know, you saw Turkey sending armed drones to Ukraine. The United States has supplied Javelin anti-tank missiles. There was a giant arms contract signed by the UK last year. And at a certain point, Putin thought, maybe not also entirely incorrectly, that Ukraine was becoming a kind of de facto uh, NATO member, or that rather there wouldn't be that much of a difference between NATO formally accepting Ukraine and NATO sending arms and uh, soldiers uh, to Ukraine. And, and so those issues that felt really uh, big to Putin on, on the kind of historic frame that we talked about a second ago began to manifest in Ukraine. And, and Putin felt like they were becoming acutely threatening and acutely intolerable in Ukraine and through Ukraine and, and essentially threatening to invade Ukraine, which is, you know, Although Russia says that's not what it's doing, that's very much what 130,000 Russian troops yeah. surrounding Ukraine on three sides are doing, um, that he could uh, use the threat of an Ukraine invasion to get the West to talk uh, about the bigger issues that have, have bothered Putin, not just for the past months, but really for the past years. 
um, and, and an open question that we can talk about is like, is that working, right? Is, is the Biden administration engaging on that? Should the Biden administration engage on that, right? Should the West be willing to re-examine some of the previously settled questions of the Cold War, you know, under the threat of Russian invasion? Uh, that's the you know, drama we're essentially seeing play out now. So I, I wanted to get into NATO then, because, you know, um, my experience, you know, with this in government was... Uh, you had had a NATO membership action plan offered to Ukraine. So that's like the, the formal step that initiates the possibility that that a country like Ukraine uh, could become a NATO member. In 2008, <clears throat> Georgia's offered a NATO membership action plan at the same time. Within a year, Georgia's been invaded <laughs> and two territories have been uh, de facto, not formally annexed, but kind of de facto recognized by, by Russia. What was interesting is that then when Yanukovych, pro-Russian politician, becomes the president of Ukraine again and kind of commits to neutrality, um, kind of takes off the table NATO membership, you know, there wasn't geopolitical tension around Ukraine. But he's a corrupt character who's beholden to Russia. And um, and, and that sparks the, the Maidan protests in 2013 that lead to Yanukovych's ouster and the return of a government that wants to pursue NATO membership, and we've been in this state of conflict ever since. Um, so it, it, whether you agree with Putin or not, it's pretty clear that he really does care about this issue of NATO membership. There have been some noises the last couple of days that perhaps there's been some give on the NATO issue from Ukrainians, or maybe from Europeans, because you've had Macron and now Schultz there. Um, it, do, what is your sense of, of how important NATO membership is to Ukrainians during Kyiv, whether or not um, U Ukrainians might accept the trade of p committing to neutrality in return for those 130,000 troops going back to their barracks. Because um, it feels like, you know, it's hard to see this getting resolved just with the United States saying it'll be transparent about some military exercises, which is essentially the kind of proposal, or one aspect of the kind of proposals Biden was making. Um, if if NATO membership is is the thing that has to be traded away, is that something you think that your sense is that Ukrainians would be open to, or is this so embedded in their desire to break away from Russian dominance that that it's a it's a concession that a, a Zelensky couldn't make? I'd say a few things about NATO and Ukraine. The first is the way that Putin is his own worst enemy. You know, there's been so much ink spilled in the U.S. and so much kind of um, you know hand wringing about how. Putin is this great strategic genius playing 5D chess, whatever that means, um, you know, running circles around uh, American uh, politicians. And sure, there are ways in which, you know, being both an autocrat with singular control of your country's politics and, um, you know, Putin's maybe indeed geopolitical skills have allowed him to, to sort of outflank or outmaneuver the West in certain questions. But at the same time, he can make awfully um, kind of self-injurious mistakes, just like any other um, politician. In fact, maybe even, you know, all the more given the nature of his, his rule and the fact that there aren't internal checks on his decision making. And we can see that very well in the context of NATO and Ukraine. Before 2014, there was something like low single digit support for Ukrainian uh, membership in NATO inside Ukraine itself. If, if you ask the question, I, I forget the exact formulation, but it was basically, you know, how would you like to see Ukraine's security guaranteed? It was like a common, is a common poll question that's asked repeatedly of Ukrainians. And pre-2014, that number was in the low single digits, the teens somewhere. Now it's above 50%. And the only person who can take credit, as it were, for that number, that incredible shift uh, in, in support for NATO is Vladimir Putin. So he, he has brought about the very thing that he um, has been afraid of. And I don't think that's the mark of a great um, strategic geopolitical thinker, but rather someone who, who has made a series of um, self-injurious mistakes on, on the geopolitical front. That said, now we are left with a situation where, where NATO membership is a much more core issue for Ukraine than it was eight years ago. The eventual uh, you know, ascension to NATO is now embedded in the Ukrainian constitution. To, to For Ukraine to declare that it is no longer interested or no longer aspires to join NATO would require a constitutional change, which would, uh, we can kind of speculate or argue about the degree, but would certainly kick off some kind of political crisis. The other thing we should 
remember is Ukraine is a democracy, an, an imperfect democracy. Uh, a democracy is still very much doing battle um, with corruption and insider dealing, but it's a democracy, a, a boisterous, um, you know, heterogeneous democracy with lots of different factions and lots of different uh, political camps. And for Zelensky at this point in his presidency, and, and although he was elected with 73% of the vote, a really large majority and mandate, that support has been falling steadily. I think it's at or below 50% these days. For him to make a move to change the constitution and you know, publicly deny this aspiration to join NATO would, would kick off a political crisis that could see Zelensky swept from office. We don't know exactly how it could, could play out, but it wouldn't be this easy snap of the fingers. It's not just like Zelensky could meet with Biden and NATO leaders in Brussels and, and make a deal and say, okay, fine, you know, I'll uh, give up on, on NATO if I can keep the Russian troops. He would have to get that through parliament. I mean, I don't have to tell you about the difficulties of um, getting a treaty signed by a president through a domestic legislature, right? Like that's not always a, um, uh, a guaranteed uh, slam dunk and nor is it, you know, it wasn't in the case of Obama and the Iran deal and it wouldn't be the case uh, in uh, Zelensky and um, sort of giving up on NATO um, aspirations. That said, I'm, I'm sure there are all sorts of clever workarounds and, and formulations that, that talented statesmen and women and diplomats can come up with you know, the question is there the political will for that um, in, in Ukraine, in Washington, you know, what would be acceptable uh, to Russia? I mean, one thing that Putin and others have been saying since the beginning of this current crisis is because they felt like they were manipulated in the 90s. And, you know, we can argue endlessly about, you know, were they and, and who misled whom? I don't I think the Russians have a little bit of a case, but, but not nearly as strong as the one they make about um, Russia being uh, misled about NATO expansion, being, um, being promised that there wouldn't be expansion correct, eastward. Correct. Yeah. But 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 nonetheless, what I think is genuine is the degree of uh, distrust on the part of of Putin, almost trauma. I think it's fair to say, in the case of Putin, some officials about that experience, and so they they are demanding really ironclad assurances. So it's possible that the kind of clever um, workaround that might be politically possible in Kiev wouldn't suffice Putin and maybe you know NATO and uh, Washington wouldn't go for it either. The other issue is that from the Ukrainians I've spoken to, and these are people you know, inside the Zelensky administration or, or close to it, people with government experience, they're all really frustrated that this is on them to solve. In other words, they feel like Russia's beef is really with the West writ large, NATO as an institution, um, Ukraine is, is essentially the kind of sacrificial victim here. Uh, why can't NATO uh, or the US uh, come out and say, in the interest of peace, we are declaring, we are you know, retracting that 2008 uh, agreement and we are no longer considering Ukraine for membership in the near future. Why, why does Ukraine have to be the one to make that decision unilaterally, risk uh, political crisis, internal turmoil, some people you know, it's convenient for them to say politically, but some people in the Zelensky administration are talking about civil war if they, if they were forced uh, to go uh, for such a measure. I mean, that's in their interest to sort of kick the can or, or, or whatever the metaphor is back to the you know, US and, and NATO, but they're not entirely wrong about the political threat that they would face. So why, why should they do it? Why can't NATO or, or the US come out uh, and make that announcement? But you know, neither NATO or the US wants to do it for the precedent setting reasons I think um, you know you might even be able to speak to more clearly um, than I, but that's you know neither Biden nor NATO, other NATO leaders want to be in the position of in the you know uh, under the barrel of a Russian gun to uh, you know be starting to rejigger what NATO is promising and its general you know security posture. So nobody really wants to do it. It's, it's a solution that's in the air and you would think could be obvious, but when it gets to the point of, you know, who actually should do it and what form it should take, it gets a lot more complicated. Yeah, no, that's a good, good point. Um, it, it is, it is in the, that ball could be in NATO's court though, because you need consensus among the alliance to admit new members. And I, you know, I don't see any NATO member that would raise its hand today to say that they'd <clears throat> fight a war with Russia over Ukraine. So it does kind of beg the question of what this is, 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 it, is about. Um, I, I did want to just ask you too about Russia. Um, you know, you've spent so much time there. Um, 
And I, I noted your, uh, you and I both noticed something in, in common on this Putin. Um, there's a great quote uh, uh, that embodies kind of this fixation with Putin's genius. Uh, it was from, of all people, a former CIA station chief, which made me a little concerned about um, our station chiefs, saying, uh, it, I think in the Times, remember Vladimir Putin is a KGB guy. He doesn't think like Biden does. Putin comes from Mars and Biden's from Venus. Vladimir Putin is playing his own game, and his chess game may be a little different than ours. So, so you have chess and KGB and Mars and Venus in there. Uh, but, but I, I part of what th this fixates on is is we look at Russia as just Putin. You know, he's just uh, as, as, as if nobody else lives in the country in the way it's covered in the United States at some point. What is your sense of of how Russians are looking at this today? You know, we had Jean and on a couple of weeks ago. And one of the points she made is that. One of the reasons Crimea was so popular, apart from the fact that, pretty broadly speaking, Russians feel like you know Crimea is part of Russia more than they would think that about all of Ukraine, it was pretty pain-free, too. There wasn't much resistance. There wasn't a lot of casualties. How are, how are Russians, in your view and in your contacts, kind of experiencing this moment? And are they worried about this, this possible war? Do they think it's not going to happen. Um, what's the Russian version of, of the question of, of where the, the public mood is at? And, and what risks does that potentially pose uh, to Putin or, or opportunities? You know, would, does he see this as a way of, of, of cementing his political standing even further? Or does he face the risk that this could all backfire on him? Well, first, I'd say I completely agree with Jean and Nimsova's uh, analysis there. And I would only add that if you look at what's happened to the post-Crimea euphoria, as some sociologists were calling it in Russia, it's really collapsed. In other words, this uh, spike in um, rally around the flag patriotic sentiment that benefited Putin personally in terms of his own support rating in Russia has really cratered. And by 2022, you know, eight years later, there's not much left of this post-Crimea um, patriotic uh, boom uh, for Putin. And, and it's, I'm not clear that that's a card he could play twice anyway. Um, and it's all the more complicated by the fact that Crimea was a unique situation and there's no other place in Ukraine that Russia could take by military force uh, so painlessly and, and bloodlessly um, any other sort of military campaign, as we saw in 2014 and 15 um, in the Donbass, a, a region that is Russian speaking, historically very close to Russia, um, much more kind of uh, oriented around the shared Soviet past with Russia than other parts of Ukraine. Even that turned out to be a conflict that um, neither Russia nor its proxies could win, uh, at least when it came to the hearts and minds of the local population. So I think, you know, expanding beyond that would really be a costly and difficult enterprise for, for Russia. Maybe not so much militarily, I think that in terms of just pure military power, there's not much doubt about Russia's ability to overwhelm Ukrainian forces pretty quickly. But, but then what, right? It's like the Iraq problem for the United States. It wasn't very difficult for Iraq to overthrow Saddam or defeat his um, uh, defeat him militarily, but like, how do you then manage the country, rebuild uh, on your terms, install a government that you think is you know in accordance with your interests in the long term? That became a horrifically um, costly and disastrous enterprise, and I think um, we could expect you know I don't know how analogous or not, but it would be certainly very difficult for Russia to install and maintain a pro Kremlin regime uh, in Ukraine, even after a, in quotes, successful uh, military um, campaign. What Russians themselves think about that is interesting. Uh, and, and here you get a little bit of this um, so-called wily man or wily woman that I write about in Between Two Fires, the, the, the book that you mentioned I wrote about Putin's Russia, which gets at this idea of the way that double think still is very much alive in Russia and the way people think about themselves and their relationship well, with the state, the way that people are willing to be misled or mislead themselves about the nature of their own relationship with, uh, with the state and, and, and how the state is, is both treating them and how they in turn um, treat the state. But, but here what that means is that if you look at survey data, an overwhelming majority of Russians who are asked believe that the, uh, the party to blame here in this current standoff is the West, it's NATO, you know, Russia is essentially either the victim or playing defense, or you know, merely trying to restore what is justly owed to it, um, and it's the West that has been serially and again right now, uh, either you know treating Russia with less respect than it deserves, or or trying to in other, in other ways undermine um, Russian interest. So you have 
Russian people very much in line with the overall narrative that Putin puts out and you hear on state television and, and from um, politicians at, at all levels in Russia. At the same time, there's very little, uh, as kind of little appetite for their in, in understanding or, or rather kind of um, uh, seeing this crisis through the Western prism, there's as little interest in Russia fighting a military campaign or entering into a war to defend those interests. In other words, people may think that Russia is essentially on the in the right here, um, but very few people want to see Russia go to war to defend that cause, even that people may think um, is just. And, and, and that is, among many reasons, um, a result of, of people feeling really, I think, alienated and disconnected from the state. There isn't a lot of earnest, genuine kind of rah-rah buy-in to the Putin project at this point. I think there's a lot of people who tolerate the Putin system, who are uh, who believe that an alternative to the Putin system would be worse, but it's, it's hard to find people who are real full-throated, uh, enthusiastic um, supporters of the system now, which is, which is a change, and it, which is a change over the past five or um, uh, 10 years. So that's a system that can't really tolerate losses, especially the human losses that would occur in any sort of large-scale military conflict, Russians coming back dead, you know, in body bags. Russia went through extraordinary lengths uh, to hide military losses, both in Ukraine in 2014 and 15, and in the years since in Syria. It's a really taboo subject in Russia, I suspect, because the Kremlin knows that even as the public may have supported the idea of those campaigns in Ukraine and Syria, no one is so bought in uh, to that worldview or to that system to want to see or to be willing to tolerate the cost uh, of Russians dying in those wars. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's interesting to sum up our conversation. It's like, you know, this uh, war would be a disaster, obviously, for Ukraine. It would, it would, I think, be quite bad for Russia, and it would be quite bad for the United States and the West. But the fact that a war would be bad for everybody hasn't always prevented wars. <laughs> um, uh, what, what do you, uh, the, to, to just end here, I mean, you're in Kiev. Are your, are your plans to stay? Uh, I mean, what would happen, you know, if the, I think some people don't know the life of a, foreign correspondent. I mean, what happens if, if there is a military conflict and you're, do you stick around uh, with the U.S. embassy closed and evacuated or, or, or do you plan to, to, to come back to the U.S.? Well, supposedly, right, it's, it'll be an interesting day tomorrow if some of these reports are to be <laughs> believed. Biden briefed, uh, you know, other NATO allies that the potential day of invasion is Wednesday, February 16th. I don't know when this podcast will, will air. You know, I don't know if listeners will be able to fact check themselves whether yeah. or not that turned out to be um, true. But, you know, as we here we are speaking, we're, uh, you know, this less is why I didn't ask you to make a prediction. You know, uh, right. predictions are dangerous. I, I will make a prediction that, that I could, you know, be um, that I could come to regret um, both, you know, personally and professionally in just a few few hours. But I think that, it, you know, even uh, in a completely centralized authoritarian system like Russia, Putin would have to create some sort of narrative for why he would be launching, especially if we're talking about a you know, large scale invasion of Ukraine, because he would have to explain it in some form to the Russian public. And also I think justify it even however transparently and flimsily on the world stage, there would be some effort to make this seem like Russia was either acting defensively or at least you know, in some accordance with the principles of just war, however you know, silly or, or difficult that looked. And we're just not seeing any of, those, uh, any of those preparations in place. In fact, the last two days, Monday and Tuesday of this week, We've seen kind of the, you know, uh, green shoots maybe of Putin and other top officials around him wanting to lower the temperature. Putin today, we're speaking on, on Tuesday, um, said that some Russian uh, divisions and uh, uh, troop battalions were, were coming home, uh, that were finishing exercises on the border. I mean, we'll see if that actually happens. The people who are watching things like open source satellites and, and tracking Russian troops on TikTok, which has become another hobby of um, journalists and analysts these past months are, are not necessarily seeing that in action. But nonetheless, the rhetoric has shifted uh, slightly, you know, one small degree. But nonetheless, we're not seeing more of a ramp up toward invasion, but rather at least the temporary, I think, stepping away from it. So it'd be hard to imagine, you know, Russian missiles flying through the sky tomorrow um, in Kiev. If that were to happen, you know, I'm here. Uh, my job is to um, is to cover that to the best of my ability. I'm I'm not um, 
you know, I'm not a, I don't think, um, uh, sort of um, uh, adrenaline junkie to the point of, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. self uh, injury, right? So I don't necessarily need to be like at the spot that missile uh, were to were to land. But uh, I, I'm certainly, uh, you know, engaged and and interested and in, and in sort of motivated to cover this story wherever it goes. So to the degree that that would be, you know, both safe and, and feasible, that's what I'm here to do. Great. Well, we're so glad you could join us from there and, and share this perspective. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens, but stay safe and well. And uh, we're hopeful that the, the same can be true for the people of Ukraine there. Thanks so much. Very glad to talk. So now we will turn our attention back to our neighbor to the north, Canada, where a group of truckers continues to wreak havoc across the country. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau announced on Monday that he is invoking something called the Emergencies Act, which gives the Canadian government the authority to take steps to, quote, restore order amid the blockades by truckers and others who continue to protest COVID-19 restrictions and all manner of far-right causes. Uh, Trudeau, sounding a tougher note, said these blockades are illegal, and if you are still participating, the time to go home is now. Uh, he did make clear that this emergency order, which gives the government pretty extraordinary powers, will be time limited and geographically targeted to try to reassure people this isn't some Canadian power grab up there. But we have started to see um, some of these protesters arrested and some of this dispersed. Just to give you a flavor uh, of the mood uh, up north, Diane Deans, the chair of Ottawa's police board, said the protests have turned into a, quote, nationwide insurrection. Um, and I have to add, I've heard from many people up north, including in Ottawa, saying that it was basically terrorizing to have hon horns honking all night, people kept up, that this was not um, uh, in any way like a, a cookout, uh, as uh, the truckers were sometimes trying to portray it, but really, really disruptive and damaging people's lives. The Ambassador Bridge, which ties Windsor, Ontario to Detroit and is a key node of trade between the United States and Canada, particularly for the auto industry, was blockaded for almost a week, but it was reopened on Sunday, raising hope that industries could come back to life after a near standstill. But the protests grind on into their third week, um, and uh, there's no sign of uh, a lack of fervor uh, among the truckers who found many uh, fellow travelers uh, in the American right wing, including right wing media outlets that are eating the protest up. Tucker Carlson, in a 10 minute monologue, called the protest, quote, the single most successful human rights protest in a generation. When we come back, we will talk about the far right movement in Canada that is getting a lot of support in the United States, including talking to a leading expert on the radicalization and the Canadian far right. OK, I'm very pleased to be joined by Amarnath Amarasingham, who is a professor at Queen's University in Ontario, Canada, and a researcher of radicalization and extremism. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm a big fan of the podcast. That's great. So glad that we can get some some Canada coverage here. I want to start with a basic question, you know, um, who, who are these truckers? What are these protests? Um, uh, you've written and talked uh, extensively about both the populism of uh, the movement itself, but also some of the transnational elements. We obviously see a lot of U.S. support from our right wing crowd or far right crowd. How would you describe to a global non-Canadian audience who these people are that have sown such havoc in Ottawa and, and at the border? I think um, one thing to understand more broadly is, you know, Canada is coming out of its fourth lockdown at the moment. Uh, we have masks mandates uh, still. We have to show vaccine passports when we go to restaurants. Um, the lockdown has had an, a massive impact on small businesses, uh, on children who've been kept out of school for a long time. Um, and so there's this kind of broad grievance that has popped up uh, over the last two years or so, um, which has now morphed into a kind of populist movement, anti-government uh, movement. Um, and 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 so on. And I think part of the organizers, um, the organizing people who have been behind this convoy, uh, we've known for for a long time, right? So they they initially tried to organize uh, an earlier convoy in 2019 called United We Roll, which didn't really go anywhere. Um, they've been part of other uh, militia movements. They've been part of other conspiratorial movements. Uh, they have a history of white nationalism, uh, anti-Semitic views. One of them went on a kind of Holocaust denial tour across Canada a while back. Um, and so the organizers are are one part of the conversation. They're you know quite seedy characters. They're um, they, they're the driving force behind behind some of this mobilization. Are they truckers? I mean, you know, like a, a simple <laughs> question, I guess, but like, because yeah. you seem to be describing, you know, really political actors more than just like a bunch of angry truckers. Yeah, some of them are definitely truckers, but others um, are kind of 
identify broadly in terms of the working class in Canada, particularly the West Coast of Canada, uh, who've been involved in a lot of activism that is uh, not, not only anti-Trudeau, but generally um, around this sense that Ottawa doesn't care about the West Coast, Ottawa doesn't care about us, all these elites uh, in the capital um, don't care about the West Coast, etc. So that, that kind of popular sentiment is very old in Canada and it's very vibrant. Um, it's, it's now all kind of grouped together with this anti-lockdown sentiment, um, uh, which has really brought all of this into the mainstream, right? So they've um, they've gathered more money than ever before. They've gotten a lot of people out of their seats in the dead of Canadian winter, which in itself is a achievement. Um, and 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 so there is a there there is a kind of mass mobilization that they've been able to accomplish, which we haven't necessarily seen a lot of before. I mean, Canadian politics is generally pretty boring <laughs> and um and to see you know tens of that or you know thousands of people drive across canada um and kind of uh, mobilize this much has been um has been something to watch in, in and of itself so now i want to kind of break this into pieces uh the canadian piece uh the kind of broader political piece and then the global piece so just starting at the canadian kind of far right and and you know you've researched uh, radicalization and extremism um how, what is the nature of that community? I mean, how how big is it? How mobilized is it? Um, how organized is it? Um, what what it, what do you guys deal with north of the border in terms of a far right extremist movement that that may be reaching some new level of prominence? Yeah, I mean, compared to the U.S., it's obviously much smaller, much less noisy, uh, much less organized. We do have groups like the Proud Boys, the Three Percenters, um, Adam Waffen Division, the Base, um, and a lot of different accelerationist groups. Um, but they're generally uh, fairly fringe, not don't have really um, uh, kind of they haven't mobilized to the same extent that we've seen in the U.S., where there's literal plots to kidnap the governor and uh, governor of Michigan and you know plots to blow up community centers and things like that. Um, we, we've seen some violence here, but it's generally been um, less popular, less uh, ha has less of a following. Um, I think what I think again with the with the COVID pandemic, um, it was it was a real shift and a real boon to a lot of these movements because um, they all of a sudden found themselves with a common cause, right? The anti-government movements, the hardcore far-right movements, the general kind of anxiety, people with general anxiety around COVID and, and what the vaccines might mean, QAnon supporters, which has, has been a Canadian import uh, from the United <laughs> States, um, all kind of found themselves in the same room together, arguing against the same thing, uh, rallying around the same thing. And so COVID, um, and we saw this, uh, even if you look at the online data, a, a kind of drastic spike around March 2020, um, where COVID conspiracy theories went through the roof. Um, and following along with the rise of COVID conspiracy theories, all of these movements also blew up, right? And, and because they were all, um, if you were just a fringe white nationalist, and now all of a sudden, you're also talking about COVID conspiracy theories, you attract a lot more following. So they kind of rode the wave of um, COVID conspiracy into, uh, I wouldn't say the mainstream, but into a bit of a uh, bit more popularity than they had before. Um, but uh, it so it, it's, it's definitely has a presence here. It's organized. We've listed as terrorist entities uh, several uh, far right groups, including the Proud Boys. Um, and, and so the, it's definitely here, but it's not to the same size or intensity, I would say, as, as uh, in the US. And, and I want to come back to the kind of the future of Canadian politics. But but first, you, you kind of mentioned this spike on anti-vax and you mentioned the import of QAnon. Um, and, and I've seen in some of the research, including your own, that it feels like there's, you know, financial support for these move, uh, this movement from the U.S. and other places. Clearly, there's online support um, and kind of the social media amplification. Um, what is your sense of how much of the energy behind this financing or social media kind of turbocharging is coming from outside of Canada? How much is this a foreign force coming into Canada versus the kind of indigenous movement you described? Yeah, I mean, that's been a vibrant debate here uh, for a few days now. And I, I think um, there's a few different pieces to this. One is the kind of mainstream American media approach, right? Um, when BJ Dichter, who's one of the organizers of the convoy, went on Tucker Carlson's show, 
Um, he was, you know, noticeably giddy with excitement. He loved the fact that Tucker Carlson was interviewing him. Yeah. Uh, and and um, and I and I remember texting a friend of mine saying, you know, this is going to be a game changer. Like these people who are nobodies basically are now going to be minor celebrities. They're going to be influencers overnight, thanks to uh, thanks to this Fox News attention. Um, I know Media Matters did a report recently saying uh, Fox devoted something like nine hours of coverage to the con Canadian convoy um, over the last couple of weeks. Um, and so, uh, of course, T Tucker Carlson doesn't care about Canadian truckers. He he finds in that message. Um, something that's feeding into his broader uh, kind of anti, uh, you know, populist rhetoric that he's been involved with, right? So I, I think American media is always going to see the trucker convoy through the lens of its own culture wars and through its own politics. It's not, it's not something that, about Canada specifically. Um, and so that support has been major, uh, which I think is closely related to the second one, which is the fundraising component. And so when GoFundMe uh, set, when they set up the GoFundMe campaign, um, it attracted uh, close to $10 million, which was then uh, taken down. Uh, they moved to Give, Send, Go, which has now become a kind of right-wing uh, platform in itself, much like Gab and Parler were uh, for fundraising. Um, and even there, over a couple of days, they were able to raise very quickly eight, eight or $9 million, right? And so um, a lot of that funding, um, which was leaked a couple of days ago, um, uh, about 92,000 donations, uh, about 56% of them came from the US. Um, and so, and, and so it, there is a kind of important foreign component to this in terms of media attention, uh, in, terms of, in terms of ramping up the kind of culture war polarization narrative, uh, and uh, also with, with respect to fundraising. Uh, the third thing, which I'll say, which I, I think is in, in in its infancy in terms of reporting, but it's also kind of uh, an important element of this is um, how much of the online activity isn't organic, right? There's There's been some reporting of hacked accounts on Facebook, uh, content farms out of Vietnam and Bangladesh and Romania, uh, which are uh, which have been pushing a lot of this uh, trucker narrative, kind of uh, artificial amplification um, of, of some of these accounts. Um, and so I think all three of those um, are important elements of this kind of foreign interference or influence that we're seeing. Yeah, no, I mean, you're kind of between Tucker Carlson and the online, you know, farms and the donations, it's kind of in miniature a study of yeah. the global far right today. Um, you, you had an interesting piece in the Global Mail about the what is the future impact on Canadian politics? And will this, this movement, this Freedom Convoy, kind of play the role that the Tea Party did in the United States in the sense that Tea Party started as this kind of populist movement that that took over really the Republican Party. I mean, by by yeah. 2011, that's what the Republican Party was. Um, the Canadian Conservatives have not been, you know, as 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 crazy in my you know to use my words mm -hmm. as the Republican Party or as extreme or as radical in their leadership. Although I've found much to criticize about them in recent years. But what do you think the potential is for this to become the mainstream of the Canadian right? Um, do do you see this as something that is still a fringe movement, or, or or do you see this evolving? What what are going to be the factors, I guess, that could determine whether this kind yeah. of becomes the Canadian conservative movement, or whether it kind of becomes a bunch of crazy people that are part of this global far right vanguard? I don't think this has any potential to become that mainstream. Um, I mean, we have to keep in mind that about you know ninety percent of Canadians are double, triple vaxxed almost, um, and so there there uh, there's no real resonance for this becoming a majority kind of movement. Uh, but having said that, I think, um, and, and I should also say our right, uh, the rightist parties in Canada, the Conservative Party of Canada, and the People's Party of Canada are also split, right? And so they, they themselves are kind of wrestling um, for this kind of conservative base uh, and, and, and so on. So, which I think is just going to keep uh, the liberals in power <laughs> definitely yeah. as, as the yeah. right gets divided. Um, but what I think, so I, so to answer your question, I don't think it's, it, there's any potential of this becoming some sort of mainstream movement. However, I think the intensity of this protest, the intensity of this moment for them, uh, the celebrities that have been made of these people, the money that they've shown that they can raise very quickly, the uh, they've shown that they can mobilize very quickly. Um, I don't think all of that ends as the trucks leave, right? I think that that kind of movement um, is it will, will have a voice and will have a will have momentum going forward. What form that takes, whether it kind of becomes organizational, uh, whether it becomes a kind of latched, you know, attached to a kind of political party of some kind, whether they run candidates like the Tea Party did, um, 
Um, it, it's, it remains to be seen, but I think this doesn't simply end with the trucks going home. I think there's too much energy, too much momentum, um, too much kind of reputational uh, and, and reputational reputations and credibility now linked in with this that 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 um, it will have a lasting impact in some way. So it seems like you know Prime Minister Joe has been trying to find the right formula to deal with this. Uh, I think criticized for being you know too passive for a time. Now he's invoked the Emergencies Act to give greater authority to kind of break up these protests. You're starting to see police arrest people. How how important is this invocation of the Emergencies Act? And I guess most importantly though, what would you would be advising um, political leaders to do about this, <laughs> particularly that you're, yeah. you're prime minister? I mean, this was this was difficult from the very beginning. I mean, I kind of knew much like after January 6th, what we, you know, everyone was like, we never saw this coming. Right. And I knew that the same <laughs> the same talking yeah. points were going to be again thrown about. Oh, we never saw this coming. Um, they couldn't have been more open about what they were going to do. Right. That on Telegram, on um, on their kind of alternative streaming platforms or live streams on Facebook. Um, they were planning this well, you know, in, from early January on onwards. Um, but I think what happened in, from a policing perspective is that Ottawa police in particular saw this as our January 6th moment. And so they, um, I know, you know, I have friends who are members of parliament who were basically told to kind of stay indoors. I think they tried to protect the parliament buildings itself. Yeah. Um, and in the process, forgot about the streets and let the streets kind of, um, uh, just kind of carry on. And so what what these these trucks basically just parked in the downtown core of Ottawa started having uh, cookouts and started having uh, dance parties. Um, you know, one in four trucks, uh, there was some reporting that said one in four trucks have children sleeping in them. And so it became a kind of long term occupation, which immediately led to different levels of government in Canada um, passing the buck, right? So the municipal government, which is at the mayoral level, didn't want anything to do with this. Um, they kept saying, we need the federal government, we need the federal government. Um, Doug Ford, who's the premier of Ontario, didn't want to deal with it because it's an election season in, and, and he's going out for re-election in June. Um, Trudeau didn't want to deal with it because they were carrying signs that said, hang Trudeau. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and so it's very hard to kind of go have a rational conversation with people who are calling for your head. Um, and and so it just kind of sat there and nothing happened politically for a long time. And they just became kind of baked into the city. So um, but from a policing perspective, other cities learned a lot from. I don't want to say the failure of Ottawa police, but it's more the kind of uh, blind how the, how they were blindsided. So Toronto, for example, we didn't have a same similar occupation here because um, the Toronto police basically learned from what happened in Ottawa and said, "You're welcome to protest here on foot, um, but we're not going to allow trucks in the neighborhood, right? In, in the downtown core, the Toronto downtown has about ten or twelve hospitals that are massively important for all of Canada because there's kind of very rare uh, medical issues that are treated in Toronto that aren't treated anywhere else. And so we can't just have you park and stay here forever and have cookouts. Um, so all of that, I think, it happened with the policing situation. Um, the Emergencies Act, uh, I think, had a lot to do with what happened in Alberta uh, yesterday. Uh, so the Alberta protest, which is at the Coots border, which is right across um, uh, from Montana, uh, um, uh, <clears throat> basically had um, 13 arrests yesterday. Um, they searched three trucks and found kind of a cache of weapons. Um, and so eventually, I think some of the organizers of the protest said, oh, I think we've been co-opted. Um, I think we've a part of our a part of our movement has been co-opted by extremists and we're planning on leaving. And so they're, they're planning on leaving today. Um, but that that kind of sh the, the what happened in Ottawa shifted, I think, um, some of the fears that were going on in Ottawa to kind of take a much, much stronger approach, which was also um, also contributed to by what happened in, at the Windsor Detroit border, which was a major, major, major problem um, because about you know several hundred billion dollars of goods and 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 uh, trade go through that Windsor border every day, um, and they just wouldn't leave right. And and I think probably some angry calls came from the governor of Michigan to Canada oh, saying yeah. you know you 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 better you better you better get this out of the way. Um, so eventually that also uh, met was met with the more fierce response. I think there was like forty six arrests and uh, about forty vehicles were to towed away. Um, the mayor estimated that there's about a three bill three billion dollar cost to the city just from that small block, uh, just from that blockade over a couple of days. Um, so all of that, I think, came to an to, came to a head um, to kind of force a federal response. How big an event is this in Canadian history, and and what do you think? 
the lessons are that should be taken away about is there something broken that needs to be fixed here uh, in the society? Is this the inevitable fate of democracies at a time of a kind of radicalizing global far right? Um, you know, how how should we see this in the broader sweep of of, of what's happening in Canada, and and and, and how should we how, how how should people you know think about the steps that are necessary to prevent these kinds of things from happening again? And it's a good question. I think there there is a lesson. There is a lesson here in the sense that we know that these kind of major crises are always followed by misinformation, by um, by conspiracy theories, by a collapse in trust in institutions like media, academia, science, medicine, etc. Um, and so that's kind of the large, you know, second and third order consequences of COVID in a sense. Like we've we've become um, we've become conspiratorial in our thinking, uh, and I think that has a long term impact. We know. Um, you know, we, we know that as people become more conspiratorial, they vote less, they, uh, they donate money less, they volunteer less, uh, they tend not to vaccinate their kids. And so there's all kinds of consequences for post fact uh, thinking, which I think is now seeping uh, into Canada at a much more, uh, you know, m much more strongly, thanks to kind of COVID and, and the response to it. Um, how that kind of plays out over the long term will be will be the question, I think. <laughs> um, the kind of takeaway, you know, I, I think that there's a there's there's a conversation in the Canadian uh, government about a decade ago, which said, you know, are we just one crisis away from our social fabric being torn apart? Um, and everyone at that time said, no, no, you know, we we're pretty we're pretty good here. We're not we're not the United States. You know, we'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, but I think what COVID taught us is that's not true right i think we handled it horribly i think everything we we managed to politicize everything from masks onwards um we kind of uh turned everything into an ideological conflict turned everything into us versus them and good versus evil and that happened very quickly it didn't take very long from from the first instances of of, of a covid uh COVID case to kind of just turning on each other. And so uh, is, if, that's, if that's how we responded to a global crisis, um, what happens next when there's a climate change crisis or an inevitable next pandemic um, and, and, and so on? And so I think, you know, this, this idea that uh, like in the movie Armageddon, we would just all rally together against a common enemy just didn't happen. Um, and so that, that worries me a bit that, that we're, so, uh, we're so quick to polarize and so quick to turn against each other when the opposite so it should be the case. Um, but we'll, I mean, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Well, warnings to heed in Canada and the U.S. and everywhere else. Um, thanks so much for joining us. Where, where can people kind of follow your work? I mean, most of what I write, I put on Twitter. Uh, so my Twitter account is at Omar Amrasingham. Um, so anything academic that comes out usually is posted on there anyway. And so um, that's probably the best best point of contact. Great. Well, it's been fascinating to kind of follow your research because it, 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 it both illuminates what's happening in Canada, but also I think it's a part of this global yeah. issue of extremism and radicalization we're dealing with. Um, so thanks so much for, for joining and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, hopefully the trucks go home at some point here. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me.